So recently, a couple of high-level CrossFitters, uh, Tia Claire Toomey most notably, uh, James Newbury, Colin Foss, recently changed to a different sport. So they changed from CrossFit, a very high-level CrossFit, to bobsleigh with the view of making their national teams and going to the Olympics, so the Winter Olympics. So we wanted to talk a little bit about the kind of physiological and psychological demands that athletes of this high level will might need to go through and what their training might look like to transition over to another sport of such a high level and such different physical demands. It's not often we get to see such high level athletes change from one sport to such a different sport in, in a couple of different realms and the process this goes through is it's very interesting and it takes a lot of thought to this and there's kind of a lot of different kind of uh, sports science aspects that are, are worth talking to and we thought they'd be very interesting for people to kind of consider and kind of give our thoughts and opinions on what they might look like. So very often when you start sports, you start very, very young and you move through different processes which are kind of predefined. Uh, I know cross is a little bit different than that, but most Olympic sports, people start at a young age and then they develop through the specific skills and physiological demands that are placed upon them and it develops them, you know, given that they've good genetic talent already, but it further develops this good genetic talent. And so it's kind of a, a set process and you don't kind of see a whole lot in that. But when we see athletes like this move from one very, very different kind of sport to a, such a different sport to bobsleigh, so moving from cross to the bobsleigh is a lot of different kind of, uh, a lot of different kind of aspects to it. And we kind of want to talk through a couple of things and the kind of challenges they might face and some of the, so we're going to talk to you a little bit of the skills they'll need to develop. We're going to talk through a different kind of sports science or S&C kind of aspect of their training that'll need to change. And then we're going to talk to you a little bit at the end, the kind of physiological changes that their body will need to be directed through, through the S&C training and through just that training itself. Some of the processes that will change from the specific kind of energy demands and, you know, muscle fiber makeup from CrossFit all the way over to bobsleigh you know that kind of fast twitch fiber development that we want to see or that they're hoping to develop through some smart and directed snc training as owen said there are new skills to be learned obviously when you're transferring sports the classic example we started seeing or the parallels uh, we started people drawing when the first of these was announced was that oh they're used to pushing the sled at the crossfit games or like some of the CrossFit team events would have like a large sled people would push across the field. In fact, the skill of pushing a, a bobsled very, very quickly is much more akin to a 30 meter sprint or a 40 yard dash than it would be to a kind of prolonged heavy push. When we look at athletes learning skills later in life, there are certain aspects that make the learning or the development of new motor patterns a lot more difficult. The main thing that's in play here is neural plasticity. So neural plasticity is the ability of our brain structure to change so we can change connections and synapses so the pattern of neural activity can be altered. When people are later on in life and their brain has developed into like an adult brain, we start seeing these changes in patterns becoming more difficult to develop and it just makes it a lot harder to learn a new skill as an adult than it will be to learn a new skill as a child. That being said, these CrossFitters are bringing with them a skill set that's going to be valuable when they go across. So they've done sprinting, they've done really, really high intensity kind of weight training and things like that. So these skills that they've already learned are going to be beneficial for them. It's just to what extent they'll be beneficial is the real question. We've talked about it lots of times that how you learn things, uh, how we develop new skills and new habits and motor cognition in general is kind of governed by three stages. So we'll often talk about there being a declarative stage to learning, associative stage to learning, and autonomic stage to learning. It's very, very likely that these crossfitters will have already skipped the declarative stage because they won't have to think about pushing or sprinting or exerting maximal force. They'll already have done that in previous sporting activities. But now they're probably in the declarative stage, so they'll start linking cues like okay, the leg drive is similar to the leg drive I had when I was doing an all-out sprint on an indoor running machine. Or the pushing that sled is very, very similar to when I was flipping over a tire or flipping the pig in the CrossFit Games. So there are parallels that are going to help them when they go into bobsled. Uh, and we'll talk about some of the kind of differences 
and some of the similarities of these parallels, particularly in terms of the physiology later on. The final piece then on skills is how long is it going to take to develop these new skills and patterns? We often hear of mastery requiring 10,000 hours and we see some more recent studies that might suggest closer to 30,000 hours of specific training being more applicable. But in their case, as we've already said, they've done some skills and some sports before that are going to be beneficial. Bobsled isn't inherently very high skill as a sport. It's not like uh, floor gymnastics or something like that where there's a host of different movements. It's basically just sprinting as hard as possible for 30 yards and then getting in and maintaining a position. It's very, very likely that these learning curves can be cut shorter due to their previous experience, due to their inherent athleticism and due to their genetic potential. Once these athletes have learned these skills, there's kind of uh, the next big obstacle in their way is that the style of training used for bobsleigh is so vastly different to training for CrossFit. So the adaption to these skills is right, is that they're very adept athletes, you know, they're very talented. Learning new skills probably won't be massively difficult for them if they're given enough time and they're treated like full-time athletes, which it seems what they're doing. So learning that new kind of skill of, or learning that new specific sports skill of bobsleigh, you know, shouldn't be crazy difficult for them. I think what the biggest change for them will be, or the most kind of uh, important thing to change, will be their new kind of style of training. So the the strength conditioning aspect involved in developing for bobsleigh. So previously, what they would have been training for in CrossFit would have been, you know, work capacity. So CrossFit training, if you looked at it from an S&C point of view, would have been, they would have spent their last several years basically doing a very, very long GPP phase, which what makes them kind of perfect for someone looking to take talented athletes and bring them into a different sport so this is a great move in terms of you want to find athletes you're looking for athlete selection and you're trying to find someone specific who's the most malleable athlete and most prepared athlete right now who'll need the least amount of time to develop into a bobsleigh athlete and, and crossfit athletes are a great example of that so if we're to look at them from an snc point of view and we zoom out at the bottom of that triangle they're basically years of gpp phase so what they've got to go from now is like not doing as much work capacity in as little time as possible or doing the most amount of work in a given period of time what they're changing to now is doing the most effective amount of work and then not too worried about the amount of time they're doing that in so if we look at their strength training right so when we come to their strength training they need to be very very strong so i think the the average the male bobsleigh team would need to be squatting is something in the region of 250 or more so repping 250 so that's a huge demand so changing from a very high force movement but they also need to be you know on the force velocity curve which we've talked about before they need to be able to produce high force but they also need to produce that force as fast as possible so they've got to learn to produce force so maximal force development and then improve their rate of force development so things like this will be just getting stronger um the style and mindset when it comes into this training as well will be very important. So no longer will it be, you know, f- get a 5RM in 50 minutes. It'll be eight weeks of periodized training or 10 weeks of periodized training for a mass squad and try to improve that as much as possible. No matter how long that takes, refining that technique, having perfect technique with that back squat, for example, and then in trying to improve it as much as possible to maximum levels not worried about how long that would take in that session then they'll need to develop things like rate of force development so interestingly if you watch one of our pay-per-views we did recently on weighted sprints where we talked about it doesn't help you sprint faster weighted sprints in this condition are absolutely perfect that's so applicable the transfer from weighted sprints to bobsleigh is absolutely immaculate the carryover couldn't be clearer there so they'll be doing things like weighted sprints a lot of unilateral work they'll be doing plyometric work but again for example when it's like box jumps for them it's as many box jumps in as little time as possible or a max number of box jumps as long as it takes the box sign of for example the type of plyometric training to be now with box jumps will be like five sets of two or six sets of three or something like that as fast as possible long wait time in between sets they're cooling off they're relaxing and then they're trying to go as fast as possible for those three reps with the best technique so it's going to be totally different to the style of training and that's going to be something will be a little bit difficult it's to kind of get out of that mentality of being a CrossFit athlete. And we see a lot of times when athletes change from CrossFit to weightlifting, for example, it's kind of difficult for athletes to let that go a little bit. And we're not saying they're not going to do this, but it's a difficult, conscious, it's a serious switch in training mindset that when you come into S&C, for bobsleigh in particular, everything's got to be fast and perfect because you don't have much of a chance. If you look at bobsleigh, I think it's um, the first like 50 meters is the most important part of that bobsleigh sprint. So they've got to do that once and do it perfect. So that's what all their training will be kind of emulating. So it's very, very important that they get this kind of mindset of every session, every rep has to be perfect. Not efficiency of movement, but it's the most effective you can be with that movement. 
as many times as possible in a, in a small amount of time, you know. So it's not about many reps and saving energy. It's about putting the most force and as fast as possible over a short period of time is what they need to change to. And that's what their SNC training will need to reflect. So the whole purpose of this SNC program that they will be going through, the whole idea of that is trying, trying to force the most favorable CNS and muscular skeleton adaptions that they could possibly go through. So we're just going to take a little look at some of the physiological adaptions that will hopefully happen or that the SNC crew will try and being try to aim to elicit in these athletes. The physiological adaptations are the third leg of the stool. And the usual place we go to when people are changing training modalities or changing sport is you start looking at energy systems and energy demands. As everyone will know, there is three or what some people might call four energy systems. The longest acting of those will be like liposis or lipolysis. Then you have your glycolytic system, then you have your phosphocreatine system, and then you just have the actual ATP. Bobsled as a sport is like way, way, way in that starting position. So ATP and phosphocreatine, they're the real things you're looking at in terms of energy development and energy usage in the sport. This kind of energy usage, and when we consider the muscular demands of bobsled, so it's a really fast sprint at the start, it's mainly just going to be the actual ATP that's present in the cells. And then a small bit of that phosphocreatine system is where we're going to draw our energy from. And where we look at where this energy will be used, it's going to be used in type 2X and type 2A muscle fibers. So type 2A and type 2X are both fast twitch muscle fibers. Type 2X is faster of the two. It's a purely glycolytic fiber, so there's no mitochondria. It doesn't use oxygen to contract. And type 2A is like a slightly higher capacity, so it can do more work due to the fact that it has mitochondria present in it. So if we look at what the most useful fiber type would be for bobsleigh, for example, it's a highly explosive sport over a very short period of time, but you need to produce a lot of force to push the bobsleigh. So we'd be looking at something, um, the most favorable would be type 2X fibers. So if we look at the number of fiber contractions per second, given like slow touch fibers, we're looking at something like 0.5 to one fiber contraction per second. So quite slow in comparison to when we get to type 2A, so which is a mostly fast fiber type so that's something between three and four fiber contractions per second so then the gold standard the most useful one would be type 2x which is like five to six fiber contractions or fiber shortenings per second so if we look at like elite world champion sprinters the proportion of type 2x fibers they would have would be somewhere in the region of like up to 25 percent of their fiber makeup so type 2x are kind of rare but they're very very useful if you need to be fast as possible so Fiber type shifting can happen during training. Um, it's kind of a combination of genetics and kind of nurture, I suppose, or nature and nurture, given the usual kind of nomenclature. So if we look at this, right, fiber type shifts can happen after a workout and it can happen over a number of period of time. So after a single workout, we can get some fiber type shift. From, you don't develop more fibers typically. What often happens is you get a different proportion of those fibers. So a certain percentage of your fiber makeup is a certain percentage of type 2x type 2a and then slow twitch fibers so if we look at the elite sprinters like we mentioned the 25 percent type 2x are up to 25 percent say over a period of time so what kind of proportion could you expect to change so if you look at like an untrained individuals over an eight-week period um you can see maybe untrained individuals now you can see somewhere in the region of about four to four and a half percent fiber shift from you know kind of uh type from like type 2x to type 2a or vice versa it's very very difficult to elicit type 2x fiber transfer from type 2a in training so the problem with the crossfit training style right is that they've spent the last couple of years essentially changing their type 2x fibers to type 2a so it's kind of not that favorable it's not incredibly clear the process of why that happens or what happens in the changeover but it definitely happens it's, it's been well demonstrated at this stage so it would be very very difficult to change from type 2a to type 2x but the idea of this training would be that at least you would increase the number of portions as much as possible so any increase in percentage would be incredibly favorable so the difference between untrained individuals is that it could be that fiber type is more susceptible to change and then as you go further through your career and they spend more of your time you know doing type 2a or slow twitch movements like they would have in crossfit it may become that these proportions are more solidified and it's harder to change them. So it might actually be harder in trained individuals to change between proportions, regardless of genetics. So when you look at muscle fiber shortening, it's not so often the kind of the length you're doing. So in theory, you could technically use type 2X for two hours in the sprint if you were doing it fast enough. So the speed of the movement is what defines what fiber type is used most often than not. So um, 
in theory, you know, you could run a marathon with Type 2X if you were a fucking machine, but obviously, so the speed of movement that determines that. So most what happened, while they would have been doing typically explosive movements, so they would have been like snatches and box jumps and stuff like that, realistically, a lot of that would have been Type 2A, or even some would eventually would have been slow twitch fibers, given how slow they would have been moving under fatigue. So they've really got to change that mindset, like we were saying with the S&C, to change to really fast movements, really dedicated, and move them as fast as possible to hopefully elicit any kind of favorable fiber change. Like the last two pieces then are on the physiology side as well. The first bit is specific hypertrophy adaptation. So you'll see in certain sports, like in arm wrestling, you'll have one guy who has like a huge jacked arm on one side and they'll have these big imbalances or you'll see with throwers they might have incredible amounts of anti-rotational strength going in one direction same with golfers you'll see a lot of golfers with like uh, lower and mid back issues due to the fact that it's a repeated movement in one direction when we look at crossfitters hypertrophy adaptation and we look at bobsledding's hypertrophy adaptation these two things are quite concurrent so you might have slightly more upper body development in crossfitters you'll certainly have more development along the internal rotators of the shoulder so such as the pecs and the lats due to the fact that they do so much uh, work hanging from a bar they do a lot of overhead work which will develop their kind of upper back a lot more and you mightn't see that as much with the bobsledders like you'll see things like really really strong power cleans power cleans into the 200 kilos for the senior males you'll see very strong back squats which would obviously be like very quad dominant, very glute dominant. So you're talking about a, an incredibly strong set of running gear, hammies, quads, glutes, and back. This hypertrophy adaptation purely isn't just to do with producing more power and being a better athlete and having better performance outcomes. Another really important part of hypertrophy and where you'll put muscle on will be in your injury prevention regime. So when you look at preventing injuries, you're looking at putting protective structures in place to stop you from getting overuse injuries or acute injuries just from things that are outside of the normal run of the mill. Your foot might slip when you're on the track, you might hit your quad as you're jumping into the bobsled and having more muscle there will allow those joints and your limbs to just absorb more force. The last piece then is just around genetic potential. Gurf spoke earlier about fiber type expression and the fact that crossfitters will have a lot of type 2a fiber type expression versus type 2x that's certainly true but what we need to look at is the base athlete before they started training so it's a commonly held fact that if you win an olympic medal the first thing you have to do is pick good parents and this is incredibly true right genetic potential and in particular when you look at fiber type expression genetics really is the key we can have certain change in expression, but we can never change the amount of certain fibers we have. We can just grow certain fibers more and atrophy certain fibers more. We can't alter that actual amount of muscle fiber we have in any muscle group. So when we look at the CrossFitters that are coming in and we look at their kind of genetic profile, you have people like Tia Claire Toomey who've gone to the Olympics for weightlifting previously. They are incredibly high achieving athletes and it's very, very likely that their genetic profile was going to be good for bobsledding prior to doing any amount of CrossFit. So then if we were to take somebody off the streets and say, okay, Timmy, we want to make you into a bobsledding Olympian, we need to make sure that the actual genetic profile is there and it's not just that he's going to go and do seven or eight years of general preparation with a sport like CrossFit and then he'll come into bobsled and have this kind of great genetic expression. He needs to have the genetics there in the first place and then his training and his pre preparation phases will just express certain genes more. That's probably the last thing I wanted to say on this. And it's over to Gurf. So if I was the head of the Australian or the American bobsleigh team and I was looking for a pool of adults among athletic population, picking from crossers wouldn't be a bad case scenario. So they're talented athletes. They're able to display an ability to learn a wide array of skills. They've done a long GPP phase, so they've done a lot of training for a number of years. Uh, ideally, like number one would be either, you know, very, very high level talented weightlifters or very, very level high level sprinters. But very often they're occupied with other means. So someone like CrossFitter is a great selection. Uh, so I would say it'd be interesting to see how this performance ends up. Obviously, we knew very little about the actual competitive nature of uh, Bob Slay and who wins or who's not. But the sport specific demands are, you know, something that can be. And analyze in detail, so it's interesting to see what will happen. 
if you are a crossfitter watching this video for example we do have a strength training for crossfit program it's four days a week um so the focus is on everything you would need for strength training for crossfit snatches clean and jerks squats deadlifts midline you know anything you need to get better strength for crossfit we've got that and then i would say if you want to see what an elite level bobsleigh athlete's training looks like go check out blaine mcconnell so he's an instagram and a youtube post a bit of training on both of those so he's something like a, a 200 kilo clean uh, one i think a 158 snatch squatting 250 for reps great athlete very explosive pretty jacked so bobsleigh's bobsleigh athletes kind of go under the radar for how talented and how athletic they are so i would definitely go check him out uh if you have any questions below or any comments we always appreciate the old algorithm comments if you watch the videos and you're not subscribed there why the fuck aren't you subscribed go subscribe uh if you want to be powerful and you want to get a high squat maybe uh james newbury is watching this go get the road to anywhere squat program eight weeks two sessions a week up to 45 kilo pbs we've seen so check that out uh thanks for watching guys we really appreciate this if you like this style of video and there's other things you want us to talk about in this realm just let us know and uh, we really appreciate it thanks guys